which is that very top layer. If you all look up here, there's fruits hanging off these trees. Those are Passiflora edulis. That's passion, passion purple varieties, the yellow varieties, the red varieties. This was a hard hat only area two months ago. The fruits are falling by the second. I had 3,000 fruit fall out of this garden this year. Those fruits go for four to seven dollars a piece in the grocery store. I mean, it's just like money falling out of the trees. You know, I and mean, that's not a problem in my eyes. You know, that, that's the kind of problem we want out here. That's what we're looking for. Fifty percent of the trees on the property. You know, I mean, it's like a treasure hunt for adults too. I got to be honest. I mean, every time I pick one up, I'm like dollar, dollar, dollar. And the juice, they're incredibly sweet. They're one of one of my favorite overstory type, you know, buying crops for down here. They feed them to the animals. They're only in the grocery stores because they can pick them early, they ripen after they're picked, and they ship well. It's all about shelf life in the grocery stores. You know, the mangoes that we can grow here are night and day. There's no fiber. They're pure juice. It makes a, you know, you can never eat a Tommy Atkins again after you've grown your own mangoes. produce up to 2,000 pounds of fruit a year. You won't be able to keep up. You'll be feeding your neighbors. Like, we're not going to know what to do with all these starving people. Hammock understory, like I said, we had 26 degrees six nights last year, and I have a little laser temperature reader, which I've been out here reading the ground temperature all over the farm, and I've recorded up to a nine degree temperature difference in this canopy. So as you can tell, it's a lot cooler right now, and it's a lot warmer in the wintertime. So it's, it's almost like a living greenhouse. We've created this microclimate. You know, we're part of this big tree system of the land behind us. This land that's all enclosed. So it's keeping us, you know, much cooler in the summertime, much warmer in the wintertime. Most of our subtropical fruit trees, things that we're pushing back in these areas, bananas, you know, mangoes, star fruit, lychee, um, longan, you know, they've evolved through a jungle setting. These trees were not growing in full sun in rows and fields. You know, they evolved through a jungle. That's why we're growing them in the jungle here. So we're not getting quite the production you could get if you were further south and growing them in their, you know, right temp temperature range but we are able to grow them and push them and, and still get fruit set. Like we had a Kerry awesome. Mango this year, which is an early flowering variety of mangoes. You know, typically speaking, I would tell you if you want to plant a mango at your house, to plant a late flowering variety because you're going to have a much better chance of a fruit set. So for us to get a fruit off an early flowering mango, which was probably the best known variety of mango there is in this area. This bed right here is maybe two months old now. And these are just turmerics. This is taro which is also a root crop, typically a wetland root crop. We have malanga growing in these areas over here also. Makes a gorgeous, you know, understory, elephant ear looking plant in the understory, and it's edible. So, you know, I look at this as a, a multi-use species, you know, it's also elegant in the landscape, and it's giving you food. You know, most of this stuff is in my opinion. You guys have a banana tree, and it's not fruiting, it's not happy. That's the biggest problem with bananas. Bananas are, are heavy, heavy, heavy feeders. You'll see we have, Tons of bananas. I've got 40 different varieties of bananas. I have everything from the old cracker varieties of banana, like Orinoco and Seminole, all the way to the more exquisite varieties like ice cream and namois that taste like marshmallow textures, you know, also kiwi aftertaste. I mean, they're, they're excellent. After you've had a homegrown banana, you can't go back. Like my wife's bought them a couple times over the last two months. And I didn't touch them. I bananas are just heavy, heavy, heavy feeders. They produce high levels of potassium. Bananas need to be fed. They're almost like I compare them to like a tomato. Tomatoes are heavy feeders. So what things that we do for our bananas to feed them, not only do we do the biochar and the compost tea, we mulch them monthly. We put compost on them monthly. Wood ash. Wood ash is probably one of the best supplements for the garden there is. It's very high in potassium, you know. Bananas produce tons of potassium. Wood ash, you have a fire in your backyard, you're just saving that ash and you're spreading it out on the fruit trees or on the bananas in the garden. You know, once this banana tree fruits, it dies. You know, we chop and drop that banana right into the system and then pups are just constantly coming back up after. The heart of the banana is underneath the ground. It's called the corm. That's the, the whole base of the tree is underneath the ground, you know, and it's constantly putting up pups. So, I mean, I would say we get just as well a production in the understory with bananas as anybody growing them in full sun. I think it has something to do with they're not drying out either. You know, bananas are heavy feeders. They like moisture. You know, it's very hard to do down here without irrigation. We have no irrigation any part of the farm back here. You know, this is just heavy mulch, understory, and we're obviously keeping all that rain that hits that land into the soil profile for as long as possible. You know, that mulch has a lot to do with that. It acts as a sponge. You know, it's almost like a living cistern. You know, you're constantly collecting, constantly collecting. So we have a very low cation exchange. One of the ways we do that, and we find the best way to do that, is like this big pile we have over here. 
That is dominantly oak mulch. So that has leaves in it, that has twigs in it, and mostly oak, like I said. Oak being that pioneer climax species through this central region of Florida, that means that all that beneficial bacteria, all that fungi is already present to break oak mulch down. So if I was to bring in cypress mulch here, that means that bacteria, that fungi is not gonna be present to break it down. You know, also when you're buying cypress mulch, bag mulch, you know, this stuff that you're getting from the box stores, it's typically pure carbon. It doesn't have the leaves in it. It doesn't have the twigs in it. It's gonna typically rob your soil. So when you get that nitrogen carbon ratio, the breakdown process isn't gonna rob the plants. It's gonna bring in all different types of beneficials. I mean, if you look at this path over here, it's pure black dirt. When we moved into the farm, that was pure white sand. All I've been doing is putting mulch there. Right now, there's no mulch down from the heavy rains we've been having. We had a little bit of an issue getting some truck stuff. So I've had to scrape it up off the driveway, but you know, this entire piece of property was pure sand when we moved in. We didn't just call it Sand Hill Farm also because we are in a big pile of sand. We're really close to Crossbar Wellfield. I don't know if any of y'all are familiar with that. Pinellas County back in the late 60s bought a few thousand acres right across the street from us. They get almost all of their water from Pasco County. So that means they're estimating 7 million gallons a day leave this area, but who knows? I mean, that's an estimate. It could be 10 million, it could be 15 million. So our ground level water has really dropped. A lot of our lake, you know, natural lakes, natural ponds in this area are dried up. Cruz Lake is dried up. The name of my neighborhood is Winding Creek. It should be Dry Creek. Typically, there is no water in that creek. Right now, we only have water coming through the creek because we just had that tropical storm. Hermine came through. So all that water from the central region of the state is coming across Green Swamp, coming across 75. And since we've been in the neighborhood, we've had that creek run three times. So pretty exciting stuff. Um, like I said, the mulch is literally the key for our growing systems. This is a waste product. You all have tree companies working in your area all the time. They have to pay to get rid of this material. So, you know, if you all are looking to create a system like this, you all are looking to kind of do something like what we're doing here today, hook up with your local tree companies, contact these guys. You're doing them a favor and they're gonna give you free materials that ends up being some of the best material in the world. So when you see mulch start to break down, that mushroom that's created that comes out of the ground, everybody sees, that's the fruit. So if we have a tree with fruit on it, you know, pretend that's the fruit of the tree. The entire tree is underneath the ground. When you pull back the mulch that's been starting to break down and you start to see those white webs, that's the mycelial network. That's basically like the internet of the soil. They're proving now that plants can communicate and transpire nutrients from one plant to another through that mycelial network. You know, we don't have a mycelial network in, you know, standard agriculture. All that's done with, you know, pure sandy soils, chemical fertilizers to feed these plants, you know, with organic fertilizing or with organic growing, you know, this is a much slower process. We're feeding the soil, we're feeding the microbes, that's feeding the plants. It cannot be sucked up like a synthetic fertilizer, you know, where a plant can just suck it up like a straw. We have an area over here I wanted to point out before we start walking around the farm. So, like I said, we, ha we have no irrigation, we use no chemicals, we use heavy mulch. You look back and blocking really it cool. together. And like I said, you know, it's like the internet. It's allowing these plants to talk to each other out here. So, you know, fungal growth is good. I get clients to call me, you know, we got mushrooms in our garden. That's a good thing. We want mushrooms in the garden. We want fungus growth in the garden. You know, that means health. That means vibrancy. That means a healthy garden. So this is a sign that we want to see. I mean, this area has had no irrigation, very close to bamboo, which bamboo, we only grow clumping varieties here. Also, I want to point that out for you but the root systems on bamboo can tend to be a little bit invasive. They can tend to dry up some things around them at times. But you'll see here, as I get down to the bottom, I mean, this is just starting to lock together. It's like glue, it's from the, it's from the worms coming up in there and eat it. You know, worms don't poop where they eat. So they're gonna come up, they're gonna break this stuff down, they're gonna go and they're gonna poop around your plants. They're gonna poop in different areas of the garden. They're gonna help to break this stuff down for you.